indie rock band. They call themselves Dr. Dog. But John Hart will have more on that as we take you down to Studio A here live on the bridge. You know, there are bands that we love that we have seemingly, you know, star-crossed paths trying to get them into the studio. Today's band, one of those bands, we have wanted to have you guys uh, in here for a very long time. Dr. Dog in our studios. Thanks for coming in, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Really appreciate it a great deal. Of course, Dr. Dog playing tonight at Crossroads KC with Shaky Graves alongside. And uh, if you want to find out more about Dr. Dog, drdogmusic.com. Uh, the new CD is uh, Psychedelic Swamp. I think that one of the things that I love about your band is just hor how organic your music has been. I mean, you, especially uh, Tr uh, Toby and Scott, you two guys have just sort of grown this thing from childhood. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, we've been doing it pretty much since childhood. So, like, your first gig was eighth grade graduation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which was a disaster. Like, was it? Well, I had stage fright. It was horrible. Did, yeah, Planning so on that happening. Did that just go away over time? or? Yeah, eventually you just fail so many times. You're just like, oh, screw it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still going for it. I think that happens. That, I mean, unless you're just, like, a, like, got it immediately from, like, the, some people are just naturally good at that kind of thing, but... For me, it was tough. I don't know why I kept doing it. I kept trying, and I kept being so scared. But You know, the, I, I guess that is funny, though, because it's like some bands are more live bands, and some bands are more studio bands. And you guys are really well known for your live shows now, but you certainly started out being, you know, eighth grade studio rats. Yeah, yeah. We were a studio <laughs> band pretty much till about 2004, really. we I mean, we played a few shows here and there, but... Um, yeah, we've always self-recorded, probably started doing that. We were about 15 or 16. So your very, very, very first early recordings, were they actually on an, like an old 8-track recorder? They were on a cassette. Cassette. The very first ones. And then when we got a, a, an 8-track a little later. And that's what the, our first two records were on that. So the 8-track is actually, like, not an old, like, 8-track like you'd put in. No, the, it's a 7-inch okay. reel. It's like quarter Because your uncle tape. gave you some gear at some point, right? Yeah, yeah, he gave us a lot of gear. He gave us, uh, he gave us our first tape machine, our first, uh, like, um, cassette tape machine, and then uh, our first mic and analog delay pedal. It's really all you need. You know, the, the longer you've, you've been doing this, it seems like the whole world has moved towards you in the sense that, you know, there's, there are fewer people turning up their nose. It's sort of lo-fi. And you guys have always seemingly been pretty satisfied with whatever tools you had on hand. Yeah, yeah. The I whole idea of us being lo-fi was really just circumstantial. It's like, well, yeah. this is the gear we can afford. We don't, we want to do it ourselves. And so it wasn't, now it's very easy. Like if, if something sounds lo-fi, probably intentional because it's so easy to sound so good. It's crazy. <laughs> it's cheap. Yeah, you know the, the crazy thing, and I find myself talking about this all the time because I think it's like in the music world, there's no one single fact that's more amazing than this, but the Beatles recorded Sgt. Pepper on a four-track machine. Yeah, they were late to the game too. There are dudes doing that. I mean, in the States had already been there or already moved on to like eight and 16 tra tracks and crazy it just bounced everything from channel yeah. to channel and i don't know how they'd be done yeah pretty amazing stuff um uh toby you and scott are the principal songwriters but um you really don't do much writing together you take that? um yeah we really don't know we never really have not in a direct way like sitting in a room together going through it but um definitely seem to have somehow found a way to kind of unconsciously follow each other's cues over the years. And then from time to time, there's been a couple instances where we've swapped parts for a song or something or filled in the gaps in another person's song. Yeah, that old McCartney-Lennon thing where one has a verse, the other has the chorus. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you listen to one of those songs and you think, man, no, those are both choruses. It's two choruses. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, very little, weirdly. Not, yeah. You were such a studio band back then that... I mean, to call it a studio is... <laughs> Charitable? <laughs> pretty far-reaching. We didn't... I mean, we had a machine and a microphone and that... And a little bungalow. That was about it. Home recording, yeah. But you, you had a concept. Oh, yeah. Heavy on the concepts. It, and it was a lot like one of those... Um, 
You know, it's it's not like a horror thing, but so many of those horror films are sort of based on the idea that somebody had found the footage, right? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I was wasn't sure where you were going with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I it's not like a horror film. Yeah, no. But the can you explain the concept, Mickens? Uh, how, how much time we got? As much as you want. <laughs> how much time you got? Uh, <laughs> In a nutshell, uh, the concept is that this, there was this once this man on earth named Phrases, and um, his, he, he, um, he found himself many years into his life realizing that nothing was the way he would prefer it to be. And um, he'd been such in a slump for so long and just so numb and desensitized to all of life's joys that one day he kind of lost his mind. And he heard this ad on the... On that day, he heard this ad for this place called the Psychedelic Swamp uh, that made all of these grandiose promises about how wonderful it is and exciting and inspiring and different. And uh, so he went. Uh, and at first, it was all those things. Um, but he made a lot of sacrifices by going there. I mean, essentially, he died to those of us on Earth. And he left his wife behind. Uh, and he was never coming back. And so as he's there and he stays longer and longer, he, all of, everything's kind of relative, you know, what seems so wild and upside down and, you know, all this flourish and psychedelia eventually just becomes normal life, at which point all of those same problems he had that drove him there in the first place kind of rose back up and he realized that, you know, his issues were deeper and that he couldn't just escape in this really kind of superficial way. But then he's stuck there and he can't come back. He's learned his lesson, but he's stuck. He's also losing the ability to communicate because he's been in this bizarro universe for so long. So he puts together this tape and he sends it to us. Uh, and this tape is basically his encoded, garbled, weird, psychedelic universe message um, about, you know, take responsibility for your life and solve your problems in reasonable ways, you know? And don't try to just run from them and escape. And that's the message he wants to give back to Earth that he learned. And he puts it in our hands to take this weird tape form of his letter and translate it into the greatest, uh, biggest rock and roll album ever made so that the masses can hear it across the globe and his message can be spread. And so that's what part two is, um, is our super pop version of, uh, of his weird tape letter that he sent us. So you do this in 1999. It fills up a 90 minute cassette. You never release it. But my understanding is that it's been bootlegged quite a bit. Well, on our first tour ever, we went out with, that with nothing. Like, we had no merch. We hadn't really made an album. We'd made a ton of recordings, but didn't really, never, never thought of it as, like, make an album. So we just quickly and hastily grabbed whatever recordings we had lying around and CD, burnt CDRs and um, went out on a, about four weeks' worth of touring over the course of the first half of, like, 2004. And we just sold those CDRs. Uh, and I think we might have sold like 20 or 30 copies of that first version of The Swamp back then, and I think that's why they're on YouTube and stuff, because the image that accompanies them on YouTube is that artwork, that we, the artwork yeah. that we put out with those CDRs and stuff. So I think that's, and then, what? yeah, I mean, once it's on YouTube, anyone who's interested, you know, can hear it. Not, it's not a problem or anything like that. We're not precious about that tape. It's super weird, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no that project delusions about it needing to be kept close yeah. to, the, to home. Yeah. It sort of sat in the back of your head for all those years, though, and you all were kind of thinking every once in a while about maybe going back, but but then it was triggered by a theater company in Philadelphia. Yeah, that was the catalyst to get us back into that and finish it up, which we'd been wanting to do, like you said, for a while. It's just hard to commit your time when you get in the touring cycle of things and when you're also writing new music and everything all the time, so... Um, yeah, when they reached out to us, said they had this grant that was to encourage them to collaborate with a non-traditional entity for them, someone outside of the theater world. We were super psyched because we were fans of theirs. And, um, and then we told them about this kind of like concept album that we've been sitting on for a while, and they really liked it. So they agreed to explore that whole concept in a theatrical context, and um, we then realized it was time to do the rock and roll version of the album. So it all came together nicely. And I'm assuming you were pretty comfortable with a non-traditional entity label. <laughs> Us? Yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> so you go back and you revisit this stuff. Um, 
you know, you've got the 90 minute cassette and there, and you know, this is not 90 minutes worth of music. So I'm curious as to the editing process, how much was kept, how much you rewrote, did you just use the concepts? Um, we cut a lot. I mean, the 90 minute tape is, um, I, I think you could only, I mean, there's maybe on that tape, you know, there's maybe 12, there's 35 tracks but there's maybe what, like 12 songs in a traditional sense. A lot of it is, the idea of this tape that he's giving us is not like he made an album and he said, hey, listen to my musical album. It's more like this audio documentary of his experience in the swamp because he's trying to show you where he is, what it's like there and what he's learned. So at various points, it's just kind of ambient and environmental. You hear like a lot of swampy soundscapes and you hear, um, his inner monologues a lot. There's a lot of spoken word on the tape, and you hear like examples of popular culture there. You hear li like news clips and um, you know top 40 radio and advertisement. And so the tape is more like this collage, this multimedia experience of the swamp. And within that, there's like 12 more traditional song structures, and those are the things we um, focused on for the for the. Um, for the record, although we featured some stuff like there's that little bit inflammation swamp on there before bad advertise, and that's like a newscaster breaking down live on the air. Um, Been there, done <laughs> that's that. The kind of stuff that happens in the swamp. <laughs> Newscasters start crying on air. And, <laughs> yeah. and so, what was it like to essentially cover yourself or to play yourself on stage? The, well, the covering, I mean, to, are you talking about the stage part or the record? Either one. Well, the record was cool because it really did feel like we were just covering songs. We were so far removed and so detached um, from the point of inception that it was, <clears throat> it was, it's kind of fun to just look at. You know, you're not at, you're not as precious with the song, and you don't have as much um, as invested in it if you had just written. But it also, that, I mean, that the flip side of that is you're like how good is this song actually even like that? <laughs> those things start to creep in but uh you know but through the process and and uh getting rid of some songs and revamping some songs and just sort of beefing them up it, i love that record it's my it's the only record of ours that i've listened to after we mixed it like i we finished mixing it and i still kept listening to it. every other one it's like once it's done mixing i'm just like God, like I'm never ever listen to that again. Um, <laughs> just because you're just listening. Having to it said so that, much. though, the material will be available at the merch table, and you should buy it. Because oh yeah, it yeah. Is as worth long as you don't have to. to mix it, you guys, you probably <laughs> yeah. love it. Yeah, um, you're just listening to the radio the way people complain about things being overplayed on the radio. You you hear things too often when you're actually. Yeah, well, you totally lose them. perspective, and yeah. so it usually takes a couple years, usually an, an, another record, to go back and actually listen to the one you did before and actually be able to like sit there and not be like, Oh my God, that guitar is still too quiet. Why did we, <laughs> what is the deal with that delay? And, you know, it's like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we'd love to hear some more music if we sure, could. Yeah.
had her slumber from dream to dream. And what does she dream? Well, we know I to how I so happy just to know her. I got an old notebook, yeah, it's filled with bits and bobbles. I want to tighten it up. Dr. Dog, today in the studios here at the bridge, you can find out more at drdogmusic.com. Playing Crossroads KC tonight with Shaky Graves' new album, Psychedelic Swamp. Um, you know, we painted the picture of your early um, career and, and, you know, doing things just for the love of doing things, mostly. Um, but everything changed for you when you managed to get a CD into the hands of Jim James and My Morning Jacket. Yeah, I mean, that, that was... That was the beginning of the touring. Um, yeah, he was very, he loved the band. He, he sort of made us get to the point where we kind of figure out who was in the band, or how, what gear we had, like, <laughs> do we, we borrowed a van. You know, we had to do all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but they weren't big at the time. I mean, they were yeah. playing like 500 cap rooms, maybe. Um, so, you know, it's just, they're on a van too. I mean, it was just very, it's the kind of thing that happens all the time, but just because I think there's more emphasis put on it because the jack, my morning jacket grew and we also grew. It's like one of those few situations where you bring somebody out and like it actually works. Like we, as soon as we st went on tour with them, we got offers for more tours and then we, you know, we opened for, <clears throat> we were an opening band for probably about four years before we really started doing any real headlining work. And, um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was the start of it. We didn't even know how to tour. I mean, we could barely even gig in Philly. It was, we were, we're not like, that was never part of, the, part of the game we were very good at. And it was kind of like, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, my favorite part of the story is, is that, you know, he says, you want to come out and open for us. And at that point, you have to decide who's in the band. I mean, that, I, mean that, I just love that. Yeah, it's confusing. I mean, we had a lot of guys kind of kicking around. And there were theatrical elements. You had guys dancing behind backlit curtains. Yeah, and... yeah, we were very much more theatrical. <laughs> yeah, we still do that, actually. <laughs> kind of like a review. Um, but, uh, th yeah, it was... And then one of, the guy, one of the main guys that went on that tour, and then he was like, yeah, you know what, I'm not really into touring. So then we had to replace him. It was a... But, um, yeah, it was just kind of a... It was more of like a collective sort of thing, um, with the band, like there was another songwriter who wrote, um, and he was he was ostensibly the we thought at least in my mind I was like oh Doug's the front man, and then he quit and I was like hmm, guess it's me and Mickens now. <laughs> like, well, and you know the interesting thing is when you went back to do the psychedelic swamp project, he'd been part of the early sessions, and so you brought him back in. Yeah, fifteen and, years and later. I, and I just hilarious. think that is such a lovely thing. Yeah, I mean we're still super close. The reason he he just wasn't built for the road i guess so my morning jacket even though they they weren't you know my morning jacket when they did it they did kind of teach you guys how to do this stuff it was like a good oh yeah blueprint for you to follow For sure yeah yeah i think we said that before i mean they were the it wasn't until we started going on tour with some other bands that were 
either didn't get along or were slightly dysfunctional or just didn't seem to care about what they were doing. They, I mean, the, they were very similar to us where it's like, we're here, let's do it, let's rock, let's not, let, let's not be bitter towards each other, you know, because it's a lot of weird stuff that can go on on the road and if you can, people can start to wear you down. And <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty evident, having done a ton of tours after that, like how strong they were. So it, was, it was really cool. So when you went out on tour, it's sort of like, well, we really ought to have a CD to sell. And so you said, okay, well, we put the CD together to give to Jim James in the first place. And that really became toothpaste, which is, you know, toothbrush. or toothbrush, rather. How yeah. dare you? So, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I looked up from my notes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. But that became your first, that became your first album. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I just love everything about that story. Well, we can't wait to see you tonight. Uh, it's going to be, it is going to be so it's much cool fun. down too. It's going to be, I think, in the '60s by the time we play. Mm -hmm. As long as there are tickets available, that's the story. <laughs> wait, are you making that up? <laughs> I think the record uh, at the venue is um, a year or two ago, when Gary Clark Jr. played and. It was like nine o'clock at night, and it was still like a hundred degrees. Holy so, moly! Yeah, yeah. We've been in it. We've been touring the past week, and every day has been outside, and every day has been in the nineties. Yeah, so it's like uh, we're no stranger to this, but it, it, it takes a toll. You figured out how to hydrate, though, I'm sure. Tiny little bottles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um,
I think I was getting a message during that song. Yeah, yeah I think some the, transmissions. Yeah, I was getting transmissions. Thanks so much for coming in, guys. I, uh, uh, you know, thanks for bringing in the whole band. You want to tell everybody who's playing today? Do you guys mind? Do you want me to tell it? You guys want to tell? <laughs> they, 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 Frank McElroy on guitar over here, okay. high vocal. All right. I'm Toby on bass. That's Scott on guitar singing. That's Zach. On keys. There you go, buddy. <laughs> and Eric Slick, the legendary Eric Slick, Philly's own, <laughs> on drums. And collectively, they are Dr. Dog. Tonight, Crossroads KC, along with Shaky Graves. And again, thanks so much for taking good. the time to come in here and play. And Sarah Bradshaw, who loves you guys more than life itself, is going to be so angry with herself for missing this session. Mm. But uh, you're much loved here at the bridge. Be more angry than us about that, though. Yeah, really, I don't see how that's possible. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in, yeah. Doctor Dog, live on the bridge. Right.